Hello, this is Jeremy Elkins with Untreated Art. In this episode, we'll be making an estuary L-shaped desk using Live Edge Walnut and Blue Resin. In addition, we'll be creating infinity fractal waterfalls that flow down the live edges, so stay tuned. To get started, we visited the wood mill and located two slabs of black walnut. I was looking for slabs that were rich in color, but also had plenty of movement to the grain. Typically, you don't find a whole lot of figuring in walnut. It's pretty straight grain. That's why when I came across these two Y slabs, I knew that we were going to get both of those features out of them. The Y slabs come from the portion of the tree where they branch off in two distinct directions. The result of that are exotic grain features in that region, also known as figuring. Unfortunately, the slabs weren't large enough to get both sides of the L-shaped desk out of it, so we had to use two. What was nice about it is they were sister slabs off of the same log, so they matched up very well. In order to determine where to make the appropriate cuts, we laid the slabs out and played around with the configuration. Once I was happy with the design, we laid out our measurements and made the rough cuts. After making all the initial rough cuts, we put the slabs together to make sure that it fit well. I didn't need the seam to be perfect at this point because I'll be making final trim cuts later in the process after the epoxy pour. I planned on burning rivers down the live edges to create the infinity fractal waterfalls, so I took a direct drive sander and smoothed out those live edges before the burning process. I also still needed to shape the nose on the front of the desk where the two live edges meet. Using a sawzall, I removed large pieces at first, but then I went back to the direct drive sander to finish shaping the nose. I didn't want to change the natural look of the live edge too much, so I only removed what was necessary to shape that nose. I finished the prep work by sanding the top surface where the router surfacing marks were left behind. I do this on all my projects because I like to clearly see the grain patterns when burning in the rivers. To make the rivers, I'm using high voltage electricity with water on the wood. This typically creates a fractal pattern that's left behind burned into the wood. Although I prefer to take this one step further and create deep, wide rivers left behind instead of the superficial pattern that you're seeing initially. This is done by allowing the electricity to continue to burn for a long period of time, even after they make the initial contact between the positive and the ground. Although I am creating the smaller fractal patterns, those will be surfaced off later on after the epoxy pour, leaving behind only the larger rivers. These were very large slabs and depending on how much voltage and amperage you're using for the burn process, you can't place the probes too far apart. Before I even start burning, I pre-plan where I want the rivers to flow in a certain area. Some of the rivers will span the entire length of the desk, and the probes cannot be placed that far apart. So I will pick a spot to start, and as those rivers burn together, I will move the probes further on down the line to continue that river. Even though I can't control precisely where the rivers are going to burn, what I can do is help guide them by only adding water to the wood in the areas that I want burned. If you were to take the probes and set them down on a dry portion of the slab and turn on the electricity, they aren't going to do anything visibly. The wood does have to be wet in order for the electricity to burn. Since I had such large areas on the slabs to create rivers, I decided to wet good sized portions of them and create natural flowing rivers between the probes. The electricity wants to connect from the positive to the ground between the probes and take the path of least resistance. So even though I generously added water to the slab, I knew that the river was basically going to go from one probe to the other in that general direction. If I was working with a much smaller slab and really need the rivers to be in a particular area, I wouldn't apply as much water. To create the infinity fractal waterfalls, I start by burning a river on the inner portion of the slab out toward the live edge, but stop before it continues downward. I found that it's important to get that initial river created and well established before moving the probe onto the live edge itself. This allows the waterfalls to be created without large blotching spots on the live edges, 
that are caused by the electricity struggling to burn those live edges. There were a lot of rivers needed to be burned into both slabs of this L-shaped desk and it took several days to accomplish all of it. This part of the process can be very slow and tedious at times and it can't be rushed. I like to take my time with it and make sure that each river I'm burning in counts because once you've got that river burned in, you can't replace the wood. The hardest part on this piece was getting rivers burned in where the seam is. The two slabs are not joined and I need the rivers to seamlessly go across and not have any step over. They also need to be the same width where they meet at the seam. The other challenge I had was creating all the waterfalls. As I mentioned before, they can be very stubborn and difficult to get rivers burned on the live edges. Eventually, I was able to work through all the challenges and finish burning both slabs of the L desk. At this point, you can really start to see how wide and deep these rivers have become. They no longer resemble that initial fractal pattern that was created when we started the burning process. After the burning is completed and the slabs have had some time to dry out, I went ahead and removed all of the burned charred wood in the rivers. I find this step of the process to be very satisfying because during the burn process, I never truly know what the rivers look like until I clean it all out. For removing the charred wood, I prefer to use a 120 grit nylon wheel brush with a drill. It's stiff enough to remove all of the char, but soft enough that it doesn't scratch the walnut left behind. It does make quite the mess though, so I follow it with a vacuum to make sure that I'm collecting as much of the debris as possible. I also make sure to wear a respirator because you don't want to breathe any of that soot. I pay close attention during this time because if I find that a river isn't exactly how I want it, I can always go back and reburn it. This does happen often because during the burning, it's difficult to see the rivers clearly, but once you've cleaned them out and you've sanded off the top surface, then you know exactly what you have. I also sand the top surface for another reason before the epoxy pour and that's so that I can clearly see the grain patterns. When I add in the resin art later on down the line, I like to know the flow of the grain to match up with it. It's just a small detail that I've become accustomed to that helps me visualize the epoxy pour better. How you want your Infinity Fractal waterfalls to look is completely up to you. I decided to burn them pretty heavily so that it gives the appearance of having boulders on the waterfalls. There are many different ways that I've created the waterfalls in the past and since this project, but I really did enjoy how the boulders looked in the waterfalls on this piece. Once I finished sanding the top surface and removed all the final debris out of the rivers, then I gave it an air bath just to make sure there were no loose particles before the epoxy pour. The client requested a multi-tone blue for the resin. So I mixed in several different shades of mica powder to get that color that they were looking for. Primarily it's going to be a darker blue, but I am going to add in some auxiliary colors such as silver pearl and a lighter teal along with a darker oceanic blue just to give it a lot of texture and help bring the rivers to life. I started the resin pour by filling in this corner that I had to build a quick mold for, but it wasn't a large area so I was able to use cardboard and house wrap tape with a silicone for a seal. Next, I moved on to pouring the rest of the primary blue into the remaining rivers. As with most of my epoxy pours for the Estuary River design, I had to make sure that I didn't overfill the rivers, leave enough room for the auxiliary colors to be added down the line. When it's completed, it's gonna be a matte finish on the resin instead of a high gloss, so I didn't need to leave as much room that I normally would for a high gloss resin finish because I'll come back and add a clear resin for those. But for a matte, I do fill it pretty close to the top once the auxiliaries have been added in. The reason why I'd add that clear for the high gloss finish is so that it protects the resin art. And the same goes for a matte finish, which is why I don't want to overfill the rivers because those would just be surfaced off. And the majority of the resin art resonates on top. Once I've added in the rest of the auxiliary colors, I start blending it together, slowly mixing it, but I don't want it to completely blend. I want each color to stand out a little bit on their own. This portion is completely up to the individual doing the resin art. It's all a matter of interpretation. So 
I will mix it until I'm satisfied and then call it a day. My aim isn't to have distinct patterns left behind after finishing the resin art. It's to mimic the natural flow of water, giving it depth but also movement. I ended up using a deep pour resin because there were some areas that were over an inch thick. So this is going to take several weeks to cure before we can go ahead and surface it flat. If you surface it too soon, it will damage the epoxy, pulling out chunks as you go. I started by removing the poly tape and glue from the fractal Infinity Waterfalls. I then removed the temporary dams that were made out of cardboard and house wrap tape. They came off pretty easily. Before surfacing the top and bottom of each slab, we sand off any excess epoxy with a direct drive sander. This creates a flat surface to lay it on the router surfacing table. Even though the slabs were flat to begin with, after the burning process and adding in the resin, they do warp a little bit. We want to end up with a flat surface once again, but we don't want to remove too much off of one side compared to another. So we do shim up portions of the slab to our desired level and then start the surfacing process. Once we have removed a bulk of the surface, both on top and bottom of each slab, then we run it through a drum sander planer combo unit. This machine uses a blade drum planer on the front and a drum sander on the back. Because I want to protect the resin art on the top surface, I'm very careful to remove only a 64th of an inch at a time each pass. That does mean that I have to send it through the machine quite a few times, but I'm able to really monitor and control how much it's removing each pass. Initially, we started with 80 grit on the drum sander, but then we swap that out for 120 grit once we get close to the finish. I do always start with the top surface, even on the router surfacing table, and then once that's flat, I flip it over to do the bottom. I do this so that we don't have to remove as much material off the top surface, which would actually erase a lot of the shallow rivers. Once the top is completed, then we run the bottoms through for a quick pass to get 120 on the drum sander. Because this L-shaped desk is going to be shipped halfway across the country, we decided to do mechanical joining instead of a permanent glue up. This will not only save the client on shipping due to the size of the crate, but it'll make installation easier as well, getting these slabs through doorways, down hallways, and into rooms. We decided to use a combination of the Festool connector system along with their wood dominoes, alternating between the two for every other hole. The mechanical connectors work great for joining the two slabs together, but the wood dominoes help give it strength and support. We won't be gluing in the wood dominoes, but they will be inserted and it will be a tight fit. Everything will be pre-fitted, so here we are testing out the mechanical connectors along with inserting in the wood dominoes. It was extremely important, even more so on this one because it wasn't a glue up, to get the miter cuts as straight as possible. That will ensure that when you put the seam together, there's not a gap in between the two slabs. I will leave the mechanical connectors installed, joining the two slabs for the remainder of the finishing process. After it's all completed, I'll disassemble the two slabs for shipping. Starting with 120 grit, using random orbit sander, we work our way up to 400 grit. After 400 grit, we no longer use a dry sander, but we'll switch over to wet sanding to get the desired matte finish that we want on the resin. Before applying the finish after sanding, we'll give it an air bath with compressed air to remove all the dust and debris left behind after sanding. Then we'll use water to raise the grain and then re-sand it with 400 grit, repeating the air bath cleaning process. For the finish, we're using a liquid hard wax and applying it with a Scotch-Brite pad on a random orbit sander. The liquid hard wax finish will need multiple applications before completed. In between each application after curing, we use a Scotch-Brite pad to rough up and prepare the surface for the next application. It's important to be very generous with the first application of the liquid hard wax, ensuring that it penetrates down into the wood as much as possible. The additional applications will only help bolster the top finish. What I really enjoy about this type of finish is not only is it UV protectant and water resistant, but it also highlights the natural beauty of the grain without changing the look and feel of the wood. In the future, after normal wear and tear, and you want to touch up this finish, it's easy to do so as well. Barring any damage to the walnut that may or may not need to be repaired, revitalizing the finish only requires that you scuff up the surface with a Scotch-Brite pad, wipe on the liquid hard wax, and then remove any excess. This works great for any hardwood that is very resistant to damage, but may not be the right choice for softer wood species. 
The finish does start setting up quickly, so it's important to keep moving around working into the wood as much as possible. The last step is to wipe off any excess amount and then let it cure. And here we have the finished piece. My favorite aspect of this desk was how the waterfalls turned out on the live edges. I was really curious to see how being aggressive with the burn process to create the boulders in the waterfalls would look in the end. Experimenting and trying something new is the whole reason why I'm in this line of work. There have been many times in the past when trying something new didn't turn out as planned, but I try and learn from it and adapt for the next piece. All in all, I really enjoy how the waterfalls turned out with the boulders and I plan on expanding on this concept in the future. Both the color and the figuring in the grain of this walnut turned out amazing. Despite the additional cost, using those Y-shaped slabs was well worth it. Thank you for watching and following along while we made this Estuary L desk. I look forward to seeing your comments or any questions that you have about making this piece. My name is Jeremy Elkins with Untreated Art and please subscribe to my YouTube channel at Jeremy Elkins for future videos.